Hello, listeners. Welcome to Isaac Radio, your civilian citizens dedicated to exposing domestic and international terrorism. This is Isaac, International Center Against the Abuse of Covert Technologies, ICAACT.org. My name is Lars Drulgo. I'm going to be the host. Tonight is a somewhat special show. Your usual host, Jessa Beltram, could not be here tonight. So this is a special edition from Europe. And tonight we are going to cover some of the stories from Europe. I have invited another Danish victim of domestic terrorism to be my co-host tonight. But first off, I just want to read a little message from Jesse. Hello, listeners. I would like to thank Stephen Bell for filling in while I'm at Bohemian Grow to speak to attendees and leaders from various groups with like-minded agendas, that being to stop the abuse against unsuspecting victims of electronic terrorism via radio frequency exposure. I'm pleased to announce my fellow Danish host for today, Mr. Stephen Bell from Denmark. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you, Lars. I appreciate the opportunity. Could you please tell us a bit about your background and your a short, very short version of your story, how you became a victim of these technologies? Sure, Lars, no problem. Well, I'm Stephen Bell, 27 years old. I'm from Denmark. As you can hear, I'm half English. That's why I have an English accent. But to get into this story... I, it all became, I moved to England in 2008 uh, to find stability in life and to find myself a job, uh, which was possible because uh, my dad had a building company in England. So I took the opportunity to, to go to England and do something new with my life and to start a job. But soon after I, I came to England and worked, I, I thought my life was going really slow and uh, bit strangely my luck was was really bad just then I now I realized that I was probably being victimized uh, by these technologies but I didn't realize this fully into 2009 well I became uh, well, it became quite obvious that I was being targeted and being t- under surveillance uh, 24 7 wherever I went uh, eating indoors in my house and this uh, went on for a few months uh, And when things got uh, started to get really bad, uh, severe rumours was uh, spreaded about me amongst my friends and family, which all resulted in that I, I eventually had to move back to Denmark. And this is where the story gets uh, it gets quite wild because uh, suddenly all these rumours were being spread about me that suddenly I was an enemy of the town where I lived. I was really being chased down and surveillanced by people that I used to be friends with for all kinds of reasons I didn't really know at that time. And this became quite an upsetting and stressful event of my life where I, I really had to have to fight for my survival. And, uh, and so I did. And after a, a while, I thought to myself, well, maybe this is going on in England and this won't be going on when I'm going to come back to Denmark, where I'm really from. So I decided that I was going to move back to Denmark. But before doing so, it wasn't just as easy as that. I, I had to arrange a way to get back. This is where the story turns to a Hollywood story. And the day that I had to go to Denmark, I had arranged with my mother. Uh, she bought me a ticket, but I had to go on a bus journey to go to Stanford Airport in London. And on this uh, bus trip, I was being heavily targeted and I was under the impression that people wanted to kill me, you see. And there were some people that were friendly and people that were enemies. So to get out of this situation alive, uh, which there was made a phone call to me on the bus on the way to Denmark that if I didn't get off this bus, I would be killed. So I went on this bus, went off the bus stop at Scatwick Airport where I was supposed to pick up a ticket that someone was going to throw in a bin for me, which I didn't have no clue of at the time. So it was really really stressful and really scary as it happens. So I didn't get the ticket that I was supposed to get, so I had to get on the bus again to Stansted, where the bus driver was obviously under information from the perps that I needed to get off this bus immediately while the bus was going. The bus driver 
was signaling me to get off the bus. And he was doing this by the toilet, and the light in the toilet was switched red and green, red and green, and there was two emergency exits on this bus. And there was this van that pulled up beside the bus that I was supposed to jump on from the roof of the, from the, roof of the bus, which I, I thought was very silly, and I, I really didn't have the nerve uh, so I thought to myself, well, they aren't going to kill me in a bus where there's uh, loads of people anyways. So I had to get off at the next stop, which was in London. I got out of the bus and left all my stuff. I left my PC, I left my clothes, and just uh, ran off to a bus stop here in London where I was waiting to be signalled. And I had the obvious impression that everyone knew who I was and because I was under the impression, as I said, I was going to go to Spain to get rid of all this targeting and get to know what was going on. I didn't have a clue at the time. So I walked around for a few hours in, in this train station when this uh, fellow came up to me, signalled me I had to follow him because he had a ticket for me. So I followed him out and uh, suddenly he did just disappeared and it was all very strange. And, and finally, uh, he, I, he lo I lost him. So I went back to the train station where I, I got off the bus, where I had been signalled on the way that I just had to, to get on a new bus. So I actually walked into a bus in London, in a London train station, uh, without any money, without any clothes, without any, my, my laptop was gone. And I got on the bus uh, with no money, as I said, and I got on and there was a lady sitting on the passenger side near the driver. And she signaled me, just walk down the end of the bus, just walk down uh, without buying a ticket. So I went down, passed her and sat right down in the back of the bus. And funny enough, and, and the, tr the bus driver comes up and looks at me and looks at her and she pays for me to get on the, net, get on the bus to Stansted. So I got on the bus, she paid for the ticket with, for me without even knowing who she was which was this is very strange to, to anyone's ears, just to go on with the story. Um, and when I came to Stansted, I had loads of phone calls from my mother and my dad, and my mother was still under the impression that I was going to Spain. So she gave me ref numbers, uh, booking numbers, to a plane that was supposed to go to Spain. So I went to the desk and gave them the number, which there was no booking in my name. So this is again became a, a drama where I had to leave the desk and uh, call her again and say, what's going on, what's going on? And she even tried to speak to the lady in the counter and there was still no ticket for me. Just to make the story short again, uh, so in the end, I had to buy a new ticket, or my mum did, buy a new ticket to go to Denmark, which I had in the first place, but from the wrong, wrong time now because I was supposed to get on another plane. Uh, so she had to buy a new ticket and I had to wait hours and hours. So I was sitting in Stanford Airport waiting for my ticket to go to Denmark. So I got on a, a person sat next to me in the plane writing a text message to me saying that if I didn't turn back, my family would be killed back here in Denmark, which I ignored and I thought to myself, this can't, how can all these people I don't know sit and write things that that I'm actually doing at the time, which is impossible without some form of communication between people and me and whoever's sending these information informations out. So when I finally got back, I was a wreck. I hadn't slept for days. I, my feet were all blistered because I'd been walking miles and miles back in England, Brighton. And then I came all nervous when I came back and landed in Denmark to meet my mother and her boyfriend, which uh, was very strange because I have told them some strange things that was going on, but I wasn't quite sure what was happening and or if they knew what was actually happening back where I was in England. I was all paranoid. Well, looking everywhere I went and they were just kind of shocked to see me in this kind of state so finally we got in the car and we're going along and I was keep looking out the window to see if anyone was following us her boyfriend actually personally said to me it doesn't have eyes it has eyes it has eyes I didn't know what he meant at the time but obviously it, he meant the chip can see what you can see which evidently means the people that are watching me 
could see what I was doing. I was acting paranoid. So they obviously were aware of this. Uh, I thought I may be implanted with a microphone. I didn't have the knowledge uh, of chips at this time. This clearly shows they knew what was going on with me, my own family. I lived uh, lived with them for a few days. I was still supposed to go into Spain to to get rid of all these people that were going to kill me, whoever they are. So when I came to Varda, where they live in Denmark, I was uh, being told, not uh, indirectly, that I had to get out in the middle of the night, in the morning, about one o'clock, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there was all snow in Denmark, snow where it was really heavy snow at this time in Denmark. So I had to, I had to walk about uh, three miles, and someone was going to pick me up in the middle of the night. So I, I walked out, and I, I was sleeping next door to my mum and her boyfriend was sleeping. And they they banged on the door, or banged on the wall to wake me up. So I followed the instructions they were given to me. Uh, at the time, I didn't know, know better, because it, after all, we were my family. I walked these three miles uh, in the snow, in the, in the dark, uh, all shattered and totally paranoid and stressed out. And I walked all these miles, and there was no car to pick me up. And I walked a different way, three more miles, and there was still no car to pick me up. So I finally walked all the way back in, uh, and I walked back again and went to sleep. And I woke up next morning, uh, there was just like nothing had happened. No one said anything, no one asked me what I was doing. Uh, it went on like this for a few more days. And I had to go to uh, to a funeral. Somebody in my in family had died. And I went there to visit my family that I hadn't seen for years. And I suppose that was quite nice, but in the situation it was really stressful and really strange because everyone seemed to know what had been going on with me for the last few months without them even telling me, but I could see it, I could hear them chit-chat, and there was definitely something going on. They know, they they knew what had been going on for the last few months, which was very strange to me because I haven't seen them in years. I was keep being given these destinations to walk or to, to ride on my bike so someone was going to pick me off and fly me to Spain. I was under the impression and my family was under the impression and the people around me were under the impression that I was going to leave, uh, but they were not allowed to let me leave. And it, it all became a game, to be honest, and it was a really sick and disturbing game that this imaginary game had been set up to 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 make people think that I was actually going to go to Spain, and myself, of course. And this went on for months and months. It came to my knowledge that this was a game being set up by perpetrators to make people think, and myself think, that I was going to Spain. And I was dumb and naive and probably a little bit brainwashed, uh, to say the least. But finally, I started to realise that even my own family had turned against me and turned to the perpetrators and were obeying what these perpetrators were saying and doing. And this was really upsetting and disturbing for me because uh, family is family and that shouldn't change. So I realised this and and this is when I've really become more or less active in the TI community or starting to make, uh, make efforts to, to try and understand what was going on with me on a normal level to, to find out some scientific facts that was happening. Has this, has this been happening to other people or am I the only one in the world? Which I soon realised that there were many thousands of victims around the world. So I started to, to read a lot of, on the internet about mind control and chipping and electromagnetic uh, radio frequency and RF and so forth. And this is where I came in contact with Lars uh, Drugard, the host of this meeting. I went on the meeting, the international meeting, uh, and where I've been talking to other victims, which has been very helpful. And this is about the time that Lars told me that we were able to go to London, which I was very pleased to know that we're all meeting up.